This is going to be our first chapter 14 notes video. Um, basically, Gregor Mendel, Mendelian genetics. That's what chapter 14 deals with. So Punnett squares, terms like dominant, recessive, um, homozygous, heterozygous, all, a lot of vocab in this chapter. So it's always important to know the terms. This chapter is especially important. Um, well, we'll just get right to it. By the way, do you guys see the stupid faces at the beginning of the video? Like, I know in my Ed Puzzle, it lists like the beginning of each video as the as the uh, you know the thumbnail. So that's why I'm doing stupid stuff at the beginning because now when I look at my video library, it's like me just making ridiculous faces and gestures. Makes me laugh. Anyhow, um, let's do the share thing. There we go. <clears throat> and Mendel and the gene idea. You know, I usually say before talking about Gregor Mendel and his work that, that it was pretty amazing that a monk with, well, a curious monk, with a lot of pea plants and a lot of time on his hands, with no technology, just keen observation skills, was able to deduce a couple of laws of genetics that now with all our fancy technology have turned out to be seen spot on. So not, not to go, uh, you know, not to understate it, Mendel's work was simple, but the conclusions that he drew, I think were very astute. So again, guys, we're going to talk about Mendel's work, what he did, how he did it. A lot of vocabulary, um, you know, incomplete dominance, co-dominance, pleiotropy, epistasis. Uh, there's a good chance that there will be, I would say, at least three videos for this chapter, just to make them not too long and excruciatingly painful and boring. All right. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a good choice. I think this is worth mentioning that, you know, in science, when you want to study a phenomenon, you typically, at least in biological science, need to pick sometimes a host organism to, to study said phenomenon in. Um, you know, for instance, wanting, wanting to study heredity, it would be a poor choice uh, to choose the blue whale for your subject. Um, number one, where do you keep them? Uh, number two, how do you make that one mate with that one? Um, number three, there's a very long time between generations. You know, we, we want a lot of data, so we would like generations to happen very quickly. Um, it's just not feasible, right? Most geneticists these days use fruit flies. They reproduce like crazy, lots of different traits to look at. Um, we're talking like days on, on the order of days, not weeks before they're sexually mature. So you can get a lot of data very quickly. Uh, Mendel picked a, a, a good organism in the pea plant, Pisum sativum, the scientific name. Um, he was able to control pretty accurately which plants mated with which other plants. Um, the flowers were hermaphroditic. They had both male and female sex parts. Um, he was able to uh, remove the, the sperm producing parts so that the plant couldn't self-pollinate. But in some cases, the plant could self-pollinate. And that was advantageous as we will discuss. So he picked a good, whether he knew it or not, he picked a good organism to study heredity in. Um, Again, he could remove the male parts and then with a paintbrush, transfer pollen from one plant or one flower to another on a different plant. Um, Cross-pollination is the term for when he would make two different plants mate. Self-pollination would be uh, if a plant mated with itself. Uh, I'm going to skip some of this and talk about it with a diagram because I think it makes more sense. Yeah, this one. So this is Mendel's experimental design. And you should be familiar with the steps that he took. Um, he did this for every trait that he looked at. And actually, I'll jump ahead. You know, flower color, flower position, seed color, pod color, all these different traits he looked at. And he did the same sequence of events to study how each of them were, were passed on. 
So first thing he did was develop P generation or parental generation, pure breeding or true breeding plants. Basically that meant, say we're looking at flower color, he took a purple flowering plant, self-pollinated it, grew up all the babies from seeds, took a purple baby, self-pollinated, grew up all the babies from seeds. And he did that until all the babies were purple 100% of the time, because it'd be a mixture of purple and white flowered uh, baby plants. But he wanted to develop a true breeding purple flowering plant line. And he did that until all the babies were purple. And he did the same thing with a white flowering plant self-pollinated, grew the babies up, waited till they were all white every time, 100%. And then he had his two, um, his two different varieties, but each of them true breeding for its trait, one for purple flower color, one for white flower color. So he developed his P generation plants. Then he cross-pollinated them and got his F1 generation. F stands for filial Kind of means related it's an old school term but f1 generation when he did this he noticed that one of the two traits disappeared they were all in this case purple and that made mendel go hmm next thing he did was he self-pollinated one of the f1 baby plants to get his f2 generation and when he did that he noticed that the trait that disappeared in the f1 reappeared in the F2 about 25% of the time. So 75% were this original F1 color, 25% of the babies had the other trait that disappeared in the F1. And he found this pattern amongst all the traits that he looked at. In fact, go back to, um, go back to this chart, flower color, seed color, you name it. And it was always about a three to one ratio of the one which trait, which we now call the dominant trait, to the recessive trait, which is the one that disappeared in the F1 generation. But what I think is interesting about this, too, is, you know, it certainly wasn't exact. You know, 3.15, 2.82. Mendel was able to see the pattern, even though it wasn't like a baseball bat on the head, like exactly three to one every time. So that's what he did for each trait. Um, Mendel predicted that there were factors that were passed on from parents to offspring. These factors we now call genes. And there were different versions of these genes, these factors, um, that caused the plants to have different traits. So in other words, a purple flower factor or gene, a white flower factor or gene. And he called these versions of the gene alleles. I don't know if Mendel came up with that term. Uh, but they are called alleles, and each allele is on a specific location on a chromosome, and that location is known as a locus. So the locus is the location of a particular gene on a chromosome. Plural of locus is loci. So here's a homologous pair of chromosomes. Okay, again, one from mom, one from dad. In this spot, and let's say this is chromosome number seven in a human. In this spot on chromosome seven, um, let's say is an eye color gene. On the other homologous chromosome, there would be an eye color gene in that same spot. Now, the dad's chromosome could have a blue eye gene and mom's chromosome could have a brown eye gene, but it will be an eye color gene at that same locus on each chromosome. Here we're talking pea plants, flower color. Here's the purple flower gene. Here's the white flower gene. They are at the same location, the same locus on each homolog. So again, the concept of one gene being dominant, one gene being recessive came from Mendel's work. And something known as the law of segregation was one of the consequences of, of Mendel's work as well. Um, that basically each organism has two factors or two genes for each trait. And again, we know one from mom, one from dad. Well, what Mendel's work showed that was during meiosis, which we just learned about, during the production of sex cells, those two alleles separate or segregate into different sex cells. In other words, each sperm cell gets either the gene you had from mom or the gene you had from dad. Each egg cell gets 
one or the other when it comes to chromosomes and, and thus genes. So that the chromosomes separate and the alleles separate during meiosis. Um, a punnett square, again, it's just sort of a, a visual way of working out the probability of something occurring. Um, you know, you guys remember, hopefully from first year bio, that a capital letter represents the dominant allele, lowercase represents the recessive. Um, if purple flowers are dominant over white, capital P stands for the purple flower gene because it's dominant, but lowercase p stands for the white flower allele. Uh, we take the dominant trait's first letter, make it capital, but we take the lowercase version of that same letter to represent the recessive allele. So little p is the gene for white flower color. And you can see that here. <clears throat> if we look at Mendel's experimental design, basically here's his two purebred parental plants. So big P, big P, two of the same, call that homozygous. The other one was little p, little p. And I don't know why I formatted this way. When I transferred these in, sometimes it, no, long story, but little p, little p is the genotype of the white flower plant. Well, when he crossed them, all the babies were hybrids. They were all heterozygous. When you have two different alleles together, we term for that as being heterozygous. And since purple's dominant over white, they were all purple. Now, to get his F2 babies, he self-pollinated one of the F1s. So, again, basically, uh, this plant is the mom and the dad. <clears throat> so the big P, little p split up. Okay, and this, this is the, the law of segregation in a picture. Some of the eggs receive the dominant allele, and some of the eggs receive the recessive allele, right, in both cases. When we fill in the Punnett square, Okay, the, the gametes go on the outside. Doesn't matter, mom on top, dad on top, doesn't matter. Um, but the point is that they separate, the two alleles separate. That's the law of segregation. And we combine them in the boxes. So big P and big P go here. Little P and big P go in here. But notice we always put the capital letter first. You would never write little P, big P. Big P, little P here. Little P, little P right there. So you can see from this um, that, let me get to it, that from a phenotype standpoint, phenotype is the physical appearance, what the organism looks like. It's a three to one ratio of purple to white flowering babies in the F2. But the genotype, which is what genes you have, the genotypic ratio is one to two to one. There's one big P, big P, two big P, little P's, and one little P, little P. So be careful when you're asked questions, like what's the phenotypic ratio or the genotypic ratio because they're different. And finally, there's a thing called a test cross. So let's say you had a purple flowered plant and you weren't sure if it was homozygous, big P, big P, or heterozygous, big P, little P. Well, what you would do is you would cross that plant with a recessive individual because you know a recessive individual has to be little p, little p. So you do the cross, you look at what babies you get, and that tells you what your original dominant parent plant was. So for instance, if the original plant was homozygous, big P, big P, you'd expect all the babies to be purple, 100%. But if the original dominant purple plant was heterozygous, big P, little p, well then you'd expect about 50-50 purple flower to white flower babies. So they call this doing a test cross to determine the genotype of a dominant individual. Because it's not like it's any less purple if it's heterozygous, right? It's still totally purple. All right, so this is a good place to stop. Uh, again, guys, a lot of vocabulary in chapter 14. Um, I don't think it's real difficult stuff. You know, the, we'll go over the Punnett squares obviously together uh, in class as well. Um, but if you have any questions, let me know. And I'll see you for part two.